Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is Pamela, and you are watching Pam Entertainment TV, where we review movies, television series, and incidents of pop culture to see if those incidents affect our daily lives. Listen, I'm chugging along with these videos, y'all. And if you like the content that you see, please give me a thumbs up and hit that like button down there below. And also subscribe. It's free 99, costs you nothing. Uh, leave me a comment uh, on this video or any other videos that I have uh, on my playlist and let me know you stop by and let's engage. Listen, we are here and we are about to review Moon Knight. So let me be, be start this off. I am not familiar with this character, but from all the, the, the trailer, from all the other little pundits talking about it, I am intrigued. So I am coming into this series with a fish out of water. You know, I'm familiar with Thor. I'm familiar with Iron Iron uh, Man. I'm familiar with Black Panther. I'm familiar with those. I'm familiar with She-Hulk. I'm familiar with all those things, but I am not familiar with this particular character. And so I am intrigued. Now, I have been told that um, this character is a darker character, pretty much uh, uh, maybe on the eh, like Blade and all of those types of characters um, coming into the uh, MCU. So I am in intrigued i am intrigued i am intrigued so i will tell you that i did uh watch the first episode uh <laughs> it, it it sent me uh because this is is dealing with uh some uh, uh what is it dissociative disorder uh a mental illness but I don't know if it's if it's uh if it's true in the name of the of dissociation disorder uh because as I watch the show it seems like he is possessed more so uh be, well anyway I am trying to figure all this out so let's just start with my overall view of the thing I enjoyed the show uh particularly I enjoyed um just to see this man uh, go in and out of the different personalities and all the measures that he's taking either to try to stay awake um, or to stay within his house um, because he can't he seems to not figure out whether or not he's sleeping or not he's losing time uh, that's what's that's what's amazing to me uh, he's losing time um He's he's wakes up injured, all of this stuff. So uh, overall, I thought that because I'm somebody new, it has pulled me in. I am interested in what's going on. It um, it seems like. Um, oh, how I'm trying to choose my words right. Um, with just the minimal amount of research I did on this character, I'm uh, it, Overall, it's it, the show is bringing me in. I'm I'm curious about what's going on. It's just enough to get you interested, but not enough to tell you everything. And that's what I like. It's just enough to get you interested, but not enough to tell you anything. So let's just go over. I took some notes. You know me. I'm a habitual note taker, child. And I um, but I wanted to do this. Um, I I printed out the uh synopsis for the show and it says here now now different sites had different synopsis so this is the synopsis from um disney plus and then i wrote down the synopsis from i think imdb and uh i think i don't know where i got these two no this was another synopsis from um disney plus um and then I got this other one, I think, from IMDb. So let's go over them. So we've got, <clears throat> now this is the synopsis from the, um, the Disney Plus site. 
It says, when Stephen Grant, a mild-mannered gift shop employee, becomes plagued with blackouts, blackouts and memories of another life, he discovers that he has dissociative identity disorder and shares a body with the mercenary Mark Spector. As Stephen slash Mark's enemies converge upon them, they must navigate their complex identities while trust, while thrust in a deadly mystery among the powerful gods of Egypt. All right. Uh, then th that was descriptive enough. The other one that was descriptive enough for me was a former U.S. Marine struggling with dissociative identity disorder is granted the powers of an Egyptian moon god, but he soon finds out that these newfound powers can be both a blessing and a curse. So I just wanted to read those out because that is the information that as I'm coming into this uh to this review. So let's see where is page one. All right. So we're about to do a recap of season one, episode one of Moon Knight entitled The Goldfish Problem. So as it comes on, uh we see, we don't see the face of, of, of the person, but someone is sitting at a table. He puts down a cloth. He is uh, pouring himself a glass of water. He drinks the, the water. He closes the cloth over the glass that he is, he is, he is just consumed the water out of. And then he persists to take what looks like a hammer and he breaks the glass. He breaks the glass into little itty bitty pieces and then child, he takes that glass and puts it in his shoes and then proceeds to walk out of the room, which he was just in. Right off the bat, I'm like, Lord, who is this a glutton for pain? Who is this? Why? What are you doing? Why are you breaking glass and putting it in your shoes and then proceed to walk on this glass? You know that. Oh. And then he had on the, those, uh, Barbecue sevens, you know, them little shoes that the old men, uh, what am I calling them old men? You know, the, the, with your uncle out there barbecuing the barbecue sevens, he had on the barbecue sevens, child, and he is out here uh, uh, walking with those shoes with glass in it. So we don't see his face. We don't know who he is. And my immediate reaction I wrote down is WTF. Already I'm like, Lord, this is about to be some stuff. So then we pan over to the main character who we now know is named Steven and he wakes up and at first I thought he had like a wild, I was like, Lord, this man done had a wild sex night because he is tied to the bed and then when he got out of the bed, I see that there's sand on the ground and all of this stuff. So he gets, but then he gets himself out of the, because uh, he has on ankle chains he gets himself out of the ankle chains. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, he done had him a wild night. But then he proceeds to get up. He walks through the sand. He goes to the door. Um, He has like several locks on the door. And then he has like painter's tape on the door. So I guess he was trying to figure out whether or not he left uh, the room or not. And again, that was another, what the hell is going on? <laughs> is this man doing what he's doing? I, you know, then he's talking to his goldfish, Gus, having a full on conversation with his goldfish, Gus. And then he gets to having a conversation with his mom. He's talking to his mom, telling her all the things that's going on. Um, and he continues on. He, he continues uh, doing what he's doing for the day. Um. He goes to work, he gets into work, and I guess his supervisor is named Donna. And Donna is explaining to him that he's late and that he's, you know, he should be, you know, this is the third day in a row that he's been late. And he's, you know, he's a, he's a, he seems um, a little disjointed, but he's still a smooth talker. Because when he gets to the museum, he talks to the little girl. There's a little girl looking at a pyramid. And he kind of gives her all the information. So apparently at his job, he wants to be a tour guide. But uh, nobody is entrusting him with that assignment right now. They got him working in the gift shop. 
And like I said, his supervisor is named Donna. So as uh, she pulls him away from the little girl uh, so that he can go and get, do his job, there's this, this his coworker comes over and she's like, oh, she's talking to him and he's looking at her funny. And she's like, well, you know, I can't wait for our date on, you know, on Friday. And he's looking like, funny. she's like, yeah, uh, steak, we're going to have steak. And, you know, he's looking crazy because she was like, you don't remember, you know. So apparently in his state of mind, because he's losing time, he doesn't even remember uh, asking this woman out on a date. And so he's like, well, I'm agree. He's going to agree to go to the date. He finds her. He finds her attractive and he's going to um, agree to go on the date with her. And then his supervisor, Donna, says, "Ooh, you trying to be smooth. But it's inter- he, it, it's like he he's not remembering nothing he's just losing time he doesn't know what's going on so um as the episode progresses um oh one thing that's important about that that last scene too donna explains to him because he's been he's been late that she's not going to do the inventory she's going to make him do the inventory of the gift shop so he has to stay late to do the inventory uh coming up so just keep that in mind. Um, he gets back home and I couldn't tell whether he was trying to, the, the, the program that he was, was, um, using, uh, was saying that, you know, staying awake and he was doing different things to try to stay awake. Um, cause at first I was confused. I thought maybe he was trying to go to sleep, but then it looks like he was trying to stay awake. Uh, because he did mention that every time he wakes up, he feels like he's been in a battle. He's tired. He's uh, He can't stay awake during the day. Uh, and he doesn't know why he's so tired at night. But apparently he has some indication that something's going on because he's he's done all this stuff to keep himself awake. This is where it gets to be freaky. So he's doing all these things to try to stay awake. He's reading. He's doing all the things. Then all of a sudden, he wakes up in the middle of the field. And baby, his whole jaw is broken. Now, anybody else, that jaw just would have been broke. But he did a couple of la la guys. And then his jaw came back. He doesn't even remember where he's at or how he got there. He doesn't know where he's at. So he stands up and then there's these two guys that are in this tower. And so he waves at the guy at the tower. And then this other guy comes to the tower. He says, shoot him. Next thing you know, this man is <laughs> steaming and running for his life. I mean, he is darting, going down this little, there's like this windy road, this town. He goes into town and then you hear one of the men get on like a walkie talkie or a phone or something and says, he's headed into town. He's headed into town. Look out for him. So he goes into town and he sees all these people walking towards this, um, the square, I guess the town square. He goes in there. Uh, he, you know, he tries to blend in because, you know, he doesn't want to be caught by the people with the guns who are trying to get him. And so then there's this man that's standing up, uh, at the, in the middle of the square. First, they called him Haro. And then someone called him Arthur. And then I'm learning that his name is Arthur Haro. So, uh, he's standing in the square and he asked somebody to come up and uh, were they ready to be judged? And so I'm looking like judged. I said, oh, Lord, he's about to kill somebody. So the first man that comes up there, he holds, uh, Arthur does his hands like this. The man places his hands on top of Arthur's. And then they kind of close together. And then Arthur takes what I thought was the hammer. You remember when I said that the guy smashed the, the glass with the hammer? Well, actually, it's a cane. And so he takes the cane and places it between his two because it has like a um I'm gonna say an, an Egyptian artifact head, like um oh what is that? I can't tell you the the the, the animal the, the animal head that I saw, but he places it on his hands like this, and then the cane is swinging like a pendulum. But then on Arthur's hand, he has uh, uh, the scales. And then, you know, I recognized, I was like, that's Libra. What is he doing? Wait a minute, don't be taking my sign. What are you doing? Why has you got the scales and what's going on? 
So he takes the scale and as you look at this, it's because it's the scale is tattooed in his arm. But then when you see it, the scale just starts to move like this. And then it just keeps moving. It just keeps moving. It turns black and then it's balanced. And so Arthur tells the man, says, you are a good man. And so I was like, OK, so this is how they judge how they're doing something. So then this woman runs up. She says, I want you to do mine. I want you to I want you to. um." And she said, because I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He does the same procedure for her. However, when you look at his tattoo that's on his arm of the scales, it turns red. And she looks astonished. She's like, I've been good all my life. And he says, the scales judge your past, your present, and your future. So apparently, in, your, in what would have been your future, you've done something. And so, uh, what did he say? Uh, Amit, he says, Amit, uh, uh, he says, I judge you in the name, in Amit's name. And like I said, the man who went through his was still black. He was considered to have to be a good man. Hers turned red. He says, Amit has judged you. And then all of a sudden it just looked like the life had drained out of her and she just drops dead. Honey, they just pick her up and keep it moving. So I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> What kind of power is he got? And how is he sitting up here? I said, isn't that something that somebody is going to judge you for your past, your present, and your future? You ain't, you being judged for stuff you ain't haven't even done before. And this, and it was, I was so sad for her because she was like, I've been good all my life. And he says, yes. He says, you've been good for your past and your present. It must be something going on in, in, in what, what, what would have happened in your future that's got you gone. And I was like, well, that's not fair. <laughs> you know, life ain't fair. But I was like, isn't that something? She didn't even have a chance to uh, to correct whatever mistake that she was possibly going to make. And she's been judged. <sighs> Baby. So you remember I told you that there were the town that the, the people were running behind trying to find him. Well, two of the guys go up to Arthur and tell him, hey, we can't find him. He's somewhere in town. All of a sudden, Arthur starts speaking in a different language that made everybody just drop to their knees, except Stephen, because he doesn't understand the language. And so he's face to face with Arthur and Arthur tells him, uh, you need to give me the scarab. Now, I'm going to back up because you remember when I talked about that he had gotten up off the field with his jaw broken. Stephen is hearing voices and one of the voices said, oh, it's him. He's woken up. The, the idiot is up or something like that. And so the voice is guiding Stephen to do certain things, but he's also just uh, he's just going off on him. And uh, he kept telling him, you need to you need to surrender your body to Mark. You need to surrender your body to Mark. Stephen don't know what's going on. He's just running around here like, you know what? Who is this voice? Who is talking? I don't understand. Well, Arthur asks for the scarab that uh, uh, Stephen has in his pocket. So Stephen pulls the pulls the scarab out of his pocket and he reaches over to give the uh, scarab to um, Arthur. All of a sudden, his hand closes and he can't open his hand for nothing. He's just sitting there. I, I can't open it. Arthur's looking at him suspiciously. And so... Uh, he pries his hand open. Stephen pries his hand open. He reaches back to give Arthur the scarab. <laughs> and this goes on for like four or five minutes. Every time he tries to give it to him, his body just says, no, you're not going to do that. And he pulls back. He's running. He's doing all kinds of stuff. This is not what Stephen wants to do, but his body is, is obeying somebody else's command. So uh, at one point, Stephen is, is, is cornered. And all the, the, the men that were trying to get to him corner him. And all of a sudden, he loses track of time. He And then when he, he loses track of time and then when he comes back to himself, he sees all these, um, the, the guys that were trying to get him, they're dead on the ground. And he sees the townspeople just running from him. And so Arthur was looking at him and he was saying something to him. And I cannot remember what it was. Um, let me see. Yes. Yeah. So again, he, um, 
Let me see. I'm scared. I'm scared. Da, da, da. So Arthur sends some more men after him. So uh, Stephen escapes in a cupcake truck. Um, and he's followed by these townspeople. And I mean, uh, I don't know. Because at this point, I was like, who the hell is Mark? What is Mark? Who is Mark? Because this, the, the voice is talking to him. To try and explain to him what he needs to do, how he needs to do stuff and things. All of a sudden, when uh, Stephen is driving the truck, you know, he's maneuvering and doing all this other stuff. He's nervous. He's scared because he doesn't really know what's going on. And then one of the, uh, I'm calling them townspeople, uh, armed gunman, jumps into the truck and he starts fighting Stephen. Stephen Mines goes when he gets when Stephen comes back to himself the guy that was in the truck is dead the the people in the other truck are shooting things are flipping over a whole lot of stuff's going on but none nonetheless he makes it back um he makes it back home and he wakes up two days later he doesn't realize that he has lost time so he wakes up he thinks it's the next day and he started to talk to his fish Gus. And you remember I told you to, to keep in mind about this fish. Well, he's talking to this goldfish and then all of a sudden he looks at the goldfish and he's like, you're not Gus. Because Gus only had one fin. Now Gus has two fins. And so he takes Gus to the um, the fish shop. And he's going back and forth with the lady about this fish has two fish and my fish had one one fish. And she's like, no one sells will sell you uh, a disabled fish. She says, I don't know what you're talking about. You came in here and you got bought this fish. He's lost time. He doesn't know what's going on. And she was like, I don't have no time for you. He looks up at the clock and he says, that can't be right. That can't be the right time. And she said, yes, it is. And he bolts out because he remembered that he had his date with his uh, co-worker. So he goes to the steak shop and he's sitting there and he ends up sitting there to closing, um, to close, almost to closing. And then he, then he's looking and, and the waiter says, well, I guess your date's not showing up. And he's like, I don't understand. So he calls the woman and he was like, did you forget our date? And she says, no, I didn't forget our date. She says, I had my steak two days ago. That was Friday. And he was like, no, today is Friday. She said, no, today is Sunday. She says, you missed our date on Friday. This man done lost two whole days. And then. <laughs> and then. <laughs> he done missed two whole days. I'm like, oh, Lord. and then he's just kind of mumbling to himself. He orders a steak. He eats the steak. He uh, he had bought flowers for the lady. So I don't know what he did with the flowers. It looks like he put them in the trash, but I know he bought himself some chocolates. Then he gets on the phone and he's talking with his mom. He's like, oh, I had a great time at the date. You didn't have a date? What is you doing? So we're just going to fast forward through a lot of the other stuff. Oh, we're good. We're good. We're almost through. We're almost through. Um, He gets home and he's still hearing the voices. He's still hearing things and stuff like that. Uh, there is a scene in the elevator uh, because he's seen this... Um, I'm calling like a grim reaper image and it's freaking him out. He sees it in his, in his apartment. He goes into the, 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 the there's a um, elevator scene where he sees the grim reaper. He thinks the grim reaper is coming at him. And then there's this, this older elderly lady that comes into the, um, <laughs> comes into the elevator. She is completely and utterly freaked out by him. Cause he's like on the ground, just talking to himself and writhing and doing all kinds of stuff. She's completely freaked out. But anyway, uh, in his apartment, um, he was eating the chocolates and some of the chocolates had fallen down on the, on the ground. Then he noticed that, uh, there was like, uh, drag marks on his floor and he realizes that a table has been used to be dragged to a certain point. He looks up and he sees that there's a piece of wood in the, um, in the wall that, that has been, uh, turned askew. And so he goes up there, he gets on the table, he goes up there and he finds a phone. He gets on the phone and you see two names. You see Layla. Um, let me see. Let me see. Where is it? That's page two. Yes. You see uh, Layla and another name called Duchamp. 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 
whatever it is. Uh, so he calls, uh, the phone rings and he answers and she's like, I've been trying to get to you once. Where are you? I don't know anything about you. You've been gone. You haven't been answering your phone. You haven't been doing anything. And she calls him Mark. And he was like, what did you call me? Cause she was first. She said, what is with this accent? What is going on with this accent? What are you doing? And he's like, why did you call me Mark? And so then you start hearing this voice telling Steven, stop, stop what you're doing. Stop trying to find out stuff. Stop it. Don't try to find out any information. Child, uh, Steven is trying to figure out where this voice is coming from. He walks towards the bathroom. He turns the light on. He doesn't see anybody in there, but he cuts the light off. And as he cuts the light off, he can see his reflection in the mirror. And baby, he looks at the reflection in the mirror and the head is doing, mm-mm, mm-mm, stop, mm -mm. freaks him clean out. It freaked me out too, because I was like, wait a minute, y'all you know, look like y'all playing with the spirits. What is y'all? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's right before the elevator scene that I was talking about with him being in there and he looks like you see this green green reaper character and he goes back and forth and you know he's screaming and he's hollering he wakes up he's on the bus going to work <laughs> that has to be I, you know, I was looking at that and I was like, that has to be exhausting. That has to be exhausting. The way you, you know, you're not really getting a good night's sleep and then you're having to get up and you don't know what the hell is going on with you in your life. So it ends up, he gets back to the, um, he gets back to the museum. He tries to tell the security guard, don't let anybody suspicious in. The security guard is like, look, this is an open, there's always some suspicious folks. I can't stop people. So then, um, he's, I mean, he's panicked about it. And so Donna comes up and she, and he's like, uh, look, you got to wait, Donna. I'm trying to tell him. She's like, if you don't get your butt wherever it is, she wanted him to go, um, and go back to your post. So he decides that he's going to go over there and, uh, he looks over and he sees the guy. He says, I, I know that guy from somewhere. He walks over to the guy and apparently the people who were at the town, are there because they have a certain mark on their hand that they're showing. I don't know what the significance of showing him that mark. But anyway, they are thwarting his efforts to go anywhere or move. And some of the people, like the security guard and all that other stuff, they work for they work for Arthur. Um and they he proceeds everybody proceeds to show him the mark. So Arthur comes up to Steven. He was like, I thought that I he says I really didn't think that uh this was um where you worked and I guess you do so I guess Arthur was about to talk to, to or Arthur grabbed his hands because he was going to uh let Ahmet judge him baby he touched that man's hand and that 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 the scales was shaking like this Arthur seemed shook because he was like there's much chaos in you there's so much chaos in you and so he pulled away from Arthur because a a, a tour uh tour guide and all of her all of the tourists were coming through the door and he just ran through the door and Arthur told him, leave him alone. Let's get up out of here. So, uh, whatever Arthur, if Arthur thought he was going to, um, get that scarab and if he thought he was going to judge, oh, Steven, it wasn't working the day. So Donna ends up, uh, Donna is true to her word child. She makes, um, Steven having to do inventory. So he's in there and he does, and he completes the inventory. So he gets ready to leave. And as he gets ready to leave, he hears a dog barking. And so he starts calling a few names and he starts walking back there talking about dogs are not allowed in the museum. I'm like, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And so he's calling different names and stuff like that. And he hears the dog or whatever. So as he goes around, <laughs> as he goes around the corner, he realized that ain't no damn puppy. <laughs> No damn puppy. That wasn't no dog on the it was it was a dog man creature, but he was still on four leg. Baby, that thing chased Steven up, down, hither, and tither through the museum. And I'm like, there were some people still in the museum. They didn't hear they didn't hear Steven running around there, running around there screaming. So he ends up um running into this bathroom with all of these mirrors. It, and that's what 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 made me notice. I was like, 
wow, that's a nice bathroom with mirrors on both sides, uh, you know, the sink. It was real pretty and gold. And, but anyway, he's in there. He looks in the mirror and Mark, I guess is what this alter ego is, is telling him, let me help. Let me save us. Let me save us. And Stephen's like, I don't know. He says, listen, we don't have time for this. That thing is going to come in here and it's going to kill us unless you let me save you. Surrender to me. Surrender to me. And so, honey, that fear, that fear got to Stephen and Stephen surrendered. Next thing you know, baby, that puppy thing. <laughs> That moon dog, that puppy moon dog, whatever that the hell that thing was. I'm quite sure there is a specific name for that that creature. Baby, when he turned into Moon Knight, uh, that that puppy dog was getting his behind tore up. And next thing you know, uh, Moon Knight killed him. And then, you know, the character turns around and then he's in all of this gray. He looked good. I mean, you couldn't see his face or anything, but I liked all that gray stuff. So that was the end of it. Uh, when Moon Knight appears and kills the damn puppy. So that was the episode. I, I, I've got more questions than I have any answers for y'all. Because I'm like, what is that scare? Who the hell is Arthur? Who the hell is Mark? And what the hell was that Grim Reaper character? And uh, uh, how many personalities does Steven have? Because that's going to be interesting if he suffers from dissociative uh, disorder. He's going to have a lot of different personalities popping in and out. So I'm intrigued to see how many he has. So that was the end of the, uh, that was the end of the episode. Tell me what y'all think. Have y'all watched it? Put it down in the comments. What did you think about it? Uh, if you are, if you are not a, 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 a watcher of Marvel, has anything that I've said intrigued you? Let me know. Let me know. All right, we do this every week. Please tell your friends, tell your family, tell your co-workers. Hell, even tell them folks you do not like that I'm over here cranking out these videos. You hear me? All right, we do this every week. And as always, bye-bye.